Welcome to the Ninja Tune Podcast, and today we talk to Max Graef and Glenn Astro about their new album, The Yardwork Simulator, how they met and their process working on it together, growing up in Germany, and hearing some of the music that has inspired them over the years. After that, we'll check out some of the new releases coming out on Ninja Tune with tracks from Space Dimension Controller, Machine Drum, The Bug featuring Rico Dan, The Invisible, and Sarathi Korwa. here at Ninja Tune HQ once again and this time in the company of two artists Max Graef and Glenn Astro who have teamed up together for their release on Ninja Tune called The Yard Work Simulator welcome along yeah hello hi Yo. Um, first of all I should just quickly ask how it went last night you had the album launch party down at uh, Dance Tunnel yeah it was going pretty well I think yeah it was really good Dance Tunnel was really good also Phonica Insta was really good so this is your first album together um you've, you've done a couple of 12s including a release on your own uh, money sex record label did you already share similar production techniques when you met yeah i mean we he is using ableton and i use logic as a sequencer so that makes the whole difference already and but it was uh, it was easy you know we ended up just uh, deciding on one one program to use for the whole stuff we're doing together and then we ended up using logic as a sequencer for the whole time and uh, yeah so it was we really just use it as a recording tool really so um, and was it pretty much 50 50 your working process on each track or did you work on one and and uh, glenn work on another yeah it was a, a joint process totally i think we i mean we have a couple i think maybe two tracks or maybe even just one was like scratch that somebody did before and then we finished it together maybe yeah, maybe it was like two tracks and but the rest was where we just yeah jammed together or whatever and had, had ideas together and put it together your record sounds like it's it's sample heavy but actually it's it's you know mostly you you guys playing um, and i know producers really strive and mostly struggle to kind of achieve that sort of sound without sampling so how how did you do it and uh, what, what was all this kind of software and hardware you were using to do your album? Firstly, drums are often still sampled, so that makes a whole difference, you know. I mean, if you have like a VST and have some sampled drums, you know, it immediately sounds like everything's sampled as well, I guess. And um, I mean, MPC was uh, was often kind of the, the center point, you know, for drums or for, for loops that we wanted to work around, where to build the harmonies on or something. Have like a little mon- m- uh, melody on the on the MPC and then build the harmony around that. And um, we used uh, the roads a couple of times. Um, then the 
Nkrumah, that's an old Italian synth I, I, I use, I don't know, for like 15 years now. And you can still get new sounds of, out of it, although it has uh, two settings. It's it's the greatest synth, really. I, I love I love that thing. Yeah, also with effects, you know, we have like one harmonizer rack. We used a compressor and and um, and I think that's and maybe maybe that's that's it at, uh, on an, an, an analog effects. You know, like we we had the um, we used the the Korg MS 2000 quite a lot. Um, usually. Um, having the MIDI programmed and then run it through the, the cork and then through the racks. That's how we did it. Did uh, a lot of the sounds. Um, a lot of the bass lines are the, the cork. And um, what else? The Nord Clavia, right? Yeah. We used that a couple of times. So were you both familiar with each other's equipment? Kind of, I guess. I mean, he, he has the cork one, so I, I, I never used that before. So that was, was fun for me to, you know, to try out. Then I, I brought my Rhodes, which was, uh, which was cool to use. Um, we used the tape machine a lot, the reel-to-reel. Um, like a lot of it is actually the reel-to-reel and the uh, harmonizer. Uh, yeah, that, it's 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 also a, a delay. Like the harmonizer is like it's a delay and also yeah a harmonizer. And so we just switched between the programs. <laughs> There's a little sort of few flurries of scratches throughout, um, you know, the kind of hip hop DJing influence. Who were your favorite producers and DJs in that world? That's a tough question, actually. Um, although I used to, to like be juggle and do the whole turntablism stuff, I, I never had like a favorite um, DJ. So um, maybe executionists or stuff like that, but um, yeah, not really. That's why I also like stopped doing this whole turntable thing. <laughs> so, oh, I wasn't good at it, so yeah. And was hip hop an influence for you at all? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I did, didn't really grow up on hip hop or something, but I always, you know, had had a couple of records that were important to me, and then. Um, Pretty late, hip hop was like a really my main thing for a couple of years and influenced me a lot. Mm. Is there is there a track, one track that meant more? I could mention the the f very first record I had, the first hip hop record was um, Gangsta the Owners. That was that was the first. That was like when I was in fifth grade and we had to um, bring a, a record and introduce it to the class, and um, I just got that from a, from. A, a friend from my mom for my birthday and I I, mean, I, I only listened to rock and, and, and you know I don't know Red Hot Cheaper or Jimi Hendrix at that time so but I liked it so I just brought that because I thought nobody will know it and so yeah the owners was was definitely an influence for me yeah. <laughs> what about you Glenn is there a particular hip hop track that sticks out like every time I get like yeah I, I hear this question like it's, it's for some reason uh, just you got me from the roots just pops into my head. It's not like it was strictly hip hop, like the classic hip hop track, but somehow it just stuck in my head. And whenever I think of like, uh, yeah, influential hip hop track, it's kind of, I don't know why. Somebody told me that this planet was small. We used to live in the same building on the same floor. And never met before until I'm overseas on tour. And peep this Ethiopian queen from Philly taking classes abroad. She's studying film and photo flash focus record. Says she working on a flick and cut my click through the score. She says she loved my show in Paris at Alicia Momar. And that I stepped off the stage and took a piece of her heart. We knew from the start. 
thought that things fall apart Intent to shatter, she like That shit don't matter when I get home Get at her through letter phone Whatever, let's link, let's get together Shit, you think not? Think the thought went home and forgot Time passed, we back in Philly Now she up in my spot Telling me the things I'm telling her is making her hot Started building with her constantly round the clock Now she in my world like hip hop And keep telling me, telling me, yeah Music were you exposed to growing up? I mean, you already mentioned a bit there, sort of Jimi Hendrix and some rock stuff. What else were you kind of exposed to and listening to? Um, so when I started being interested in music, like probably it was definitely Led Zeppelin was really important to me. Um, I don't know, I watched the song Remains the Same like a million times back then. <laughs> um, then I also had like Nirvana and Pixies for a while. But that was, you know, pretty quickly over again. I mean, that's I guess everyone has that in, in their youth, you know, in our generation. Um, so, um, and then it was Red Hot Chili Peppers, like, strongly. And then from there, Funkadelic, a lot of uh, punk stuff also that they always uh, refer to. Yeah, and then it, there was always jazz as well, through, through my dad and my mom. You know, um, a lot of Herbie Hancock and... Um, we also had um, a Chick Corea record I, I used to listen to a lot when I was a kid. I didn't think about it much, but I I rediscovered later that, uh, that it's actually a super sick record. And in my vision of orchestra and stuff like that, you know, there was a lot of fusion always and um, some uh, some of the Polish stuff that my dad used to um, used to listen to a lot when he was a kid. So he uh, gave me all those twelves like. Uh, Breakout, for example, was super important. Like I remember when I was like 15, maybe or something, or definitely, you know, in the dollar sense, it was like uh, my dad said, you know, this 
like, you know, let's listen to this and we just sat down and it's just absolutely magical. Like Breakout Blues is like one of my favorite albums of of my whole life, yeah for sure. It's always gonna be that. It's it's uh, it's insane. Yeah. You, you studied for two years in London, um, where you first started producing. How did you begin sort of experimenting with production at that time? And um, did any of the music you created then, did any of it get released? So in London, I, yeah, I was always doing music before already. So in, in London, it was only that I didn't do anything else really. So I, I hardly went to school and just stayed at home. And I was living with my best friend here, and we always like film stupid movies like to like superhero movies or something and then in the other in the other half of the day i would just produce all day and and uh, drink beer and um so that was a really important uh, period for me because i you know i really focused on all that stuff and uh, and i also didn't have much equipment so that really made me you know like try to work it out and so um yeah a couple of things came out actually there was um I did an EP for Melbourne Deepcast, which I, you know, was run by, by some friends. Yeah, the Love Tapes, which is um, from that period, like the, the Love Tapes, super super cheesy title. And they also Andy, who does the label, he was like, oh, we have to make a little legacy about it. And like he wrote this stupid story that I, I broke up with a girl and then recorded those tapes. And <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, and, and Glenn, what about you? When did your musical production start and how did it start? Well, I, th I think like, I really started producing music when I was 13, maybe. I, I first started with like um, DJing, and then like half a year later with producing. Was um, I got this um, version of Fruity Loops from a good friend of mine. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then I just like started experimenting with. Like, I, I I had no idea how to like create a. I didn't even know how to uh, like where to put the drums, so it was, it was like weirdly clicking around and like waiting for a result, and then yeah, working working it out. <laughs> Have you still got all, all those experiments? Ah uh, no, unfortunately not, not. But I think my girlfriend has some some on her hard drive. Yeah. So we can have some unreleased. Uh, ah no, no. Cuts no. from the vaults <laughs> from. Okay. So and when when did it really start kind of coming into place and um, you start releasing stuff? Well, the release releasing stuff come came like much later when I was like I don't know 22, or 21. So it was like in 2011. It was pretty late. So weirdly, also for for the for the house stuff. <laughs> but yeah, it came much later. I was yeah because I was mainly producing hip hop beats and like. Uh, also house stuff, but I never showed it to anyone, so yeah. How did you both sort of first meet? I, I understand uh, Oya Records in Berlin was a bit of a meet meeting point. That's where we had our like, official date. <laughs> but now we, we started talking through the internet, actually, because we were like mutual fans of each other. So I liked his music, he liked my music, and then we just connected through SoundCloud or Facebook, I don't really remember. And got into talking and then, yeah, eventually met up in, in Berlin. And uh, Max, you were working at Oya Records, is that right? Not at that time. I, I only worked there for a couple of months, and you know, and not very seriously. <laughs> and did you share musical tastes at the time? Obviously, you liked each other's music, but your actual taste in music, other people's music, was that similar? Yeah, we we definitely agree on a lot of stuff. I would say. I mean, each one each one has different upbringings, but still, yeah. Showing each other stuff makes a lot of sense, you know, because so, you know, I know what she's gonna like when I find something or something. Usually, and the other way around. So, was the was your your short time in Oya Records was that a, a useful experience as well? Did that because uh, I understand the um, Delphonic in there, uh, Marcus, he had a part to play in some of your early releases, and certainly looking after your your record label Money Sex as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, Marcus is always super important. I, I he was there from the beginning doing everything he, he was the one who told me like 
when I, said, I sent the first demos to him and he was like, ah, oh, try to move the snare a little bit out of the grid and stuff. And I was like, oh, what an idiot, you know, what, what, do, what do you want? You don't, you know, nothing. <laughs> so he, yeah, he was super important, definitely. And also Tinko, you know, who, who co-owns the Oya is always some, I always forget to mention him, although they were both really important, you know, and working at Oya didn't really had a big difference, you know, because I was there so much anyway. And so this additional Monday where I put some records back in the shelf was, you know, was, wasn't like changing <laughs> anything really. So obviously you, you know, got an interest in, uh, in old music. Do you both actively search for in secondhand stores and thrift shops? Yeah, sure. I mean, looking for records is probably 90% of, of my, t- my life. <laughs> um, What's the best thing you've found in like a secondhand store? Well, I guess in the U.S., it's you can get crazy stuff in in record shops. I mean, there was really also also. I mean, England is, and and Holland are good, but uh, you know, U.S. just was crazy. There for like four days or something, and brought home like I don't know six sixty records something, and yeah. Was there one that you'd been looking for for ages, or yeah, tons like. For example, on this market in in, uh, in New York, we found uh, I found the uh, Rio Kawasaki juice, which I was looking for. A while. I mean, it's not really expensive on Discogs. I just with some records, when I really know them, I, I kind of always hope that I find them somewhere and don't buy them on Discogs. You know, if that make, if that makes sense. I was looking there for that one a while, and it was like ten bucks there on the market, and uh, or a different one was, for example, the Pete Dunaway. It's like a super sick Brazilian record. I found that at uh, Superior Elevation in New York. Glenn, you've obviously done a lot of digging over the years as well. Yeah, I did, but not, nothing too special actually. But like the one I remember is um, a couple of years ago, it's like maybe three years ago, I found a completely mint copy of uh, Hard Life of uh, Underground Resistance. Um, it's getting reissued now, which is kind of a shame, but um, I found it for six euros and it was like still, um, still a trick. So. I was, I was quite proud at that moment. <laughs> Thank you. 
mentioned your um, record label, Money Sex. Um, how do you go about finding artists? Is it predominantly friends or are you branching out further than that? Um, it was pre- predominantly friends, but we're kind of branching out at the moment. With because yeah, at the beginning it was just like people we actually knew and were friends with and wanted to like, yeah, I don't know, give them a chance to release music. Sounds kind of uh, arrogant, but yeah. So maybe let them do what they do and then yeah. But now are you branching out further than your the people you know? Is are you getting sort of demos sent to you? Or? Um, yeah. I, I would put it that way we try to get to know yeah. those people that we like the music by and in order to release it then. <laughs> so, um, yeah, definitely try to expand it all and do more albums, do all sorts of music we like. Get away from the whole, you know, Club 12s a little bit. I mean, it's still having that as a, as a, you know, as being a part of it, but, you know, not the main focus. Can you tell us about some of the radio shows you listen to, if if at all, or you know some of the DJs you rate? Um, I used, um, yeah, I, I used to live in the in the western part of Germany. It's a, it's a Ruhr area, around Cologne. Uh, I mean, Cologne isn't, isn't really part of it, but Essen and Bochum. Uh, so yeah, kind of local stuff. Klaus Vier. Probably it's kind of like the Giles Peterson of uh, <laughs> Germany. For, for, at least for us, uh, I was listening a lot to his radio shows. When I listen to radio, it's mostly like NTS, so like online radio. And Radio Love Love is big, definitely. It's, you know, they upload it on SoundCloud, but I I mean, they have so many episodes, I, I listen to that a lot. Definitely on the train or whatever, whenever I get the chance. The, those guys are from Cologne and, and great DJs, friends now as well, I guess. And uh, it's cool, it's cool what they do, I really like it. Maybe good to mention is uh, a local DJ who, yeah, Nano Nansen is like, he's probably my favorite DJ. <laughs> so it's good to mention him. Both released um, solo records through the Copenhagen label Tartlet. What's what was the connection there? Is that just random? It's also Oya again with, with everything that happened actually <laughs> music-wise. So um, at an in-store, we met uh, Ban Brofrik, um, who worked with Tartlet before, and uh, also the Tartlet boss was there. And then um, they heard this record that we did back then. It was a Box of Souls record. Um, which was uh, it's like kind of the label we started with um, and um, yeah then the same night they all wrote us like all four of them you know three Bond Perfect guys and the label manager you know hey you want to guys you guys want to do something for for the gym uh, the title at um, so yeah that's how it started oh yeah oh yeah was the starting point again always comes back to all your records yeah absolutely <laughs> Berlin is, I guess, more famous for the house and sort of techno scene, but is the sort of beats oriented scene healthy there? Is there a other, lot of things going on outside of the house and techno world that the general public might not be aware of? Yeah, I think so, yeah. There's uh, definitely a lot of other stuff going on, especially like there, there are a lot of like those beat beat guys in, in Berlin. They also have a pretty, pretty well known. Um, party each month there's a lot of soul and jazz stuff going on but not but i guess it's more known for for the house and techno stuff
You, you clearly both enjoy DJing, from what, from what I can see. Um, is there any records that never leave your record bag? I think a couple, actually. Probably like 10 or 15 records. That, that I mean, they do leave the record, but you know, every now and then they come back. Um, there's this uh, Warm Sound record that I uh, probably brought to every gig <laughs> since I started, which is uh, by The Raw Interpreter. Um, I think it's... Uh, maybe the second or the third one sounds I, I don't know just a, it's just a really cool label I think the Italians if I'm not wrong and uh, just really raw house and, and techno stuff it's, it's pretty cool and um, yeah a couple of, of soul records that also never leave the back really like Creative Source for example has been in there for, for more than a year now <laughs> you know a couple of cheesy ones and uh there are two ones, two tracks that I play a lot. There's um, the the Bill Withers uh, cover, uh, Who Is He version, you know, this like a disco version, and um, You Can't Hide Love. Actually, uh, uh, props to Twit One who, who showed that track to me. playing Panorama Bar next weekend uh, so that should be fun then you can have a lot of local friends around or is it extra pressure how, how is that one going to play out yeah I think it's always harder when you play in front of people you know um, but Panorama Bar is, uh, is, is, is pretty thankful I would say you know it's, it's a cool place and we also we play from one in the afternoon to uh, six so yeah, it's perfect time. We can sleep before, have breakfast, <laughs> and then party a bit. So are, are you touring with this album? Are you doing a lot of gigs? Or is there any live plans? I know, Max, you have your, your, your band as well. Yeah, so because of the band tour we're doing uh, in June and July, we, we of course, we couldn't do um, such a big tour right now with the, with the Ninja Tune album. But we do a couple of shows, you know, like this weekend, you know, we do... Um, doing Rome tomorrow and now the, the two UK, UK gigs and uh, then Panorama Bar got a couple of things we played together in, in stores yeah could have been more though you know but unfortunately we have the or I mean fortunately and unfortunately we have the band tour and uh, no live plans yet so I mean I thought about doing a live project but then there's just no time right now at all you know I'm practicing with the band and now we did all this uh, promotion for the album and at, you know 
it's just uh, not really time for it right now. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks very much for uh, for coming in and um, good luck with the album and uh, all the gigs you've got coming up. Thanks so much. Thanks. Now we turn our attention to some of the new releases coming out on Ninja Tune, starting with Space Dimension Controller and a track called The Bad People. The Bad People by Space Dimension Controller and that's from the album Orange Melamine. Next up, Machine Drum returns with a track called Dos Puertas featuring Kevin Hussein and that's out on Ninja Tune.
Machine Drum with a track called Dos Puertos featuring Kevin Hussein and that's out on Ninja Tune. Next is The Invisible and this track is called Love Me Again featuring Anna Calvi. That was Love Me Again by The Invisible, featuring Anna Calvi, and that's from their forthcoming album Patience, which is coming out on Ninja Tune. Next, it's The Bug and a track called Iceman. This one featuring Rico Dan, and this is forthcoming on Ninja Tune. Yo, yo, they go like a pizza, but the bar's hot like Antigua. Stick your nose in, eager beaver. You get roped in, take a beaver. I'm on a show, shouting, I'm the leader. I'm the ruler, I'm the father. Me at the Iceman, and me run the Gaza. Me run the border. Make you swimming in your blood like water. Me get tough like the rock of Gibraltar. Throw me a boss, yeah, me I give the order. Man talk tough, when time the guns start rising, my top. But love me no father. Love your boss, but you shun hype and get out of order. You try running at the Pascal Gaza. But me still a clap, my gun to rasp, rasp, rasp. Cool, freezing, dark, left them bleeding Cool, freezing, dark, head stop leaking Cool, freezing, dark, I'm seeking Cool, freezing, call me the ice man You know about ice man, boy, dead missing nothing on ice man You know a call like killer from Iceland Make some boy freeze from my stand My killer them start from my brand I ten grand, trust me, me no know I'm to them man Be a chap, them a go on like skin man Them no call like me, me a iceberg I pick to your blood, got nice shirt And when you say nice shirt, me no know Bobby till this my youth Me call with the blood, got nice work And me always kidding on my turn Shots crump up your belly just like worms Make up a shot fly to your side Freeze, 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 dark, let them bleed in Cool, freeze in, dark, let them bleed in Cool, freeze in, dark, I'm seeding Cool, that was Iceman by The Bug featuring Rico Dan. And finally, it's a track by Sarathi Kowa called Mora Transcendence. And that's from the album Day to Day, which is out on Ninja Tune alongside the Steve Reed Foundation. Thank you. 
That was Sarathi Kawa and a track called Mora, Transcendence, coming out on Ninja Tune alongside the Steve Reed Foundation. Well, that's it for the Ninja Tune podcast. My thanks once again to Max Grafe and Glenn Astro and assistant producer Tom. We'll be back once again with another edition very soon. <laughs>